shall we pray father god in jesus name thank you for this time of uh, uh, your spirit moving among us oh lord what an interesting topic to know when you're coming back the second coming of jesus christ open our eyes and ears and our hearts so that we may see wonderful things in your law let your holy spirit uh, minister right now as we as we speak and as we listen and you cover and you intervene and may our may each one of us see you through this so that uh, may the mystics of your word come to pass in jesus name we receive it amen god bless so this is a very interesting topic which is uh, the second coming of jesus christ right the second coming of jesus christ i don't know when is when is the last time you heard a sermon on the second coming because if you take the church uh, themes the last there's been a recent study to find out if they take the church sermons of the last uh, 12 months or the last 3 uh, years there's very few churches who are about the second coming of jesus christ they would even say jesus is a, jesus is a healer jesus is a wonder worker jesus is a miracle worker but i don't know when did you hear a last sermon on the second coming of jesus christ in fact many people even come to the extent like you know they propagate a a concept call immortality you know what's immortality they just say that uh, you can live forever like this and nothing will happen so uh, you can continue like this that's that's the concept of immortality which is happening it's so many books are there on the racks selling like hot cakes today but uh, you uh, but i want to today in the next 30 minutes i just thought i should open up few highlights on this, the theme second coming of jesus christ so number 1 i i uh, this is a uh, one it is not much uh, prevalent second people are why second reason people don't talk about it is people as a uh, lena said people are really scared right people are dire they i don't know whether it's like right from sunday school people like uh, are scared i i think uh, uh, i remember dia um, one of mine where she when every saturday she realizes oh jesus is going to come and then saturday she becomes into a sanitization of the spirit and the soul and one day to friday she is like oh okay i forget but the, the concept is hmm, it's it's really what to say people because you come you compare your preparedness against the truth whether jesus is coming back so it is scary i wouldn't say that or oh, is it clear so fundamentally you don't see much spoken second it is uh, very scary so people don't want to talk about it or rather than saying it's very uncomfortable for people to speak and thirdly there is a there are some people who are tired also i don't know when was the first time you heard about jesus coming soon uh, i mean maybe when you're just born or in your sunday school someone told you and now like 20 years passed or um Forty years passed, and then you didn't say, oh, "Okay, Jesus didn't come back." And uh, are you going to say, "I don't know"? Your children may come and ask the same question, right? You told me when I'm ten years ago, Jesus is coming. Where is he? He hasn't come. So these are some of the three things. One is the prevalence of this. Second is the emotion of fear around the uneasiness, and the third is that uh, because or they think because he's delayed, they think he's not coming. delayed and therefore he is coming these are some of the things what is happening around but uh, as all of you said there is something happening across the world right now so the second coming of jesus christ the best way to start this understanding we have this book of books in your hand i'm sure all of us believe in this book of books this book of books is called the book of prophecy okay i i did a recent uh, there's a man called david possen who has done a, he's a seminarian and a theology and then done a uh, he lived way till 90s and one of the things he has um, to understand how many prophecies are there in this book i just want to tell you there are 737 separate prophecies in this book what 737 prophecies uh, in this book this book is real this book is uh, the truth and uh, this is the most best seller across the world most sold books in the whole world even till date if you ask me which book sells more it's only the bible so out of 737 you need to understand uh, almost 80% 80% of that bible that is 80% of 737 which is 594 prophecies have come to 
uh, have been fulfilled. You know, they have been fulfilled. It's already been done. That is 80%. That leaves you with uh, how many 143 uh, prophecies to go. And predominantly, all these 143 pro uh, prophecies are aligned to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, 80% is already over, where it's all about first coming of Jesus. It's about how Jesus lived, how Jesus died on the cross, how he would be resurrect resurrected and there is an empty tomb and the promise of the Holy Spirit. Across the 66 books, you can see that. But there are 143 promises, sorry, 143 prophecies are yet to be fulfilled. And that speaks on the second coming of the Jesus Christ and the last days. So if you believe 80% has occurred, my friend, 20% will occur soon. So you can't, and history records Jesus came 2000 years back. And that's why you write BC, AD. So Jesus is real and uh, he's going to come back and 80% happened. So 20% is certain to happen. Now we're going to get into that one more thing. If 20% is yet to happen, uh, interestingly, uh, the Bible talks, I would say it's like completely 70 to 80% about the Bible theme is about coming of Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, the church doesn't talk about it. I don't know. Out of 10 sermons, you receive six sermons or six messages on second coming. But I haven't heard much on second coming. And I encourage uh, we talk about second coming. Why? Because the Bible opens with the coming and ends with the coming. Turn with me, Revelations chapter 22. And this is an eye-opening, Revelations 22, 20, where it talks about, it's like your, you say bye-byes to your children, right? What do you say lastly? When you get on your train or your flight, you will say to your children, lastly, whatever. No, you do this, go eat this, do this. You know, I kept this there, I kept that there. Now Jesus' last bye-bye is this. Turn with me to Revelation 22, 20. Yes. The he who testifies these things says, yes, I am coming soon. He closes with the bye-bye and saying, I'm coming soon. You see, I'm coming, I'm coming. Huh? So stay, stay there. And if you don't trust me, turn with me to Acts chapter 1. And there is, some, there is an angel who comes back and these people will, are still gaping at the sky. I don't know, you have a sky gaping habit. Uh, I have that habit. Uh, it's a very lovely habit, a sky gaping habit. You know what's a sky gaping habit? This is what the sky gaping habit. Now look at that. Um, chapter one of Acts, uh, he appeared to them, verse three, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And one of the occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Okay, so that's the command he gives. I'm not gonna go into that. Now, a little later, uh, I just want you to, um, go down to West End. After he said that, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently, that is the sky gaping. Okay, and they're looking at the sky gaping intently into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now I'm telling you 143 prophecies have to happen. This is one of the things supposed to happen. So this is what we're saying. So these people are looking at the sky gaping and how, how Jesus who went is going to come back soon. So significantly, significance of Jesus coming is spoken in almost all the gospels. And Jesus himself has spoken about the coming. In fact, every time whenever he's talking about his coming, he uses the word in the last days, in the last days. The key text to understand is Matthew chapter 24, which we read a few minutes back, uh, how it is important to understand. It says almost in the last days, several times. It says in the last days, in the last days. I can, I can look at, uh, you know, quote it for you. In the last days, look at that. It in fact opens with the like uh, verse 36, but the day or hour, it says in the last days, you will see nation after nation. The very word last days come again and again and again in across the gospel, across and more and more powerful in this chapter 
uh, which we read. So it's very um, critical to you for you to keep. And also you need to keep in mind why the prophecy will take place. Verse 35 of 2435, Matthew chapter 2435. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. For example, if your non-Christian friend or your children or your family who just says, you know, Jesus will not come. Or oh, then you have to remind them, 143, 80, promise, 80 prophecies has already taken. It's just 143, 20 percent yet to come. And it's very soon because it says, even the closing of the Bible says that. Now, today I just want to talk about uh, three W's and one H. So I told you the context why it is important now i am going into you know the three w's and one h which is easy for us to remember number one why should jesus come any idea why should jesus come yeah why should he come why should jesus come any anything you want to anything that comes to your mind why jesus should come establish the kingdom of god Establish the kingdom of God. Okay. He's coming to take his bride. Okay. Coming to take the bride. Okay. Now, you, uh, I'm going to go. There are two big reasons. There are many reasons why Jesus should come, but I'm going to quote only two good, two, two best reasons for why he should come. 2000 years he came as a baby in the manger, but then still people are thinking there's going to be a baby Jesus coming. Sorry, Jesus will not be coming as a baby because Psalm 96, 13 says, and uh, uh, turn with me to Psalm 96, 13. I'm going to read that for you. And it's a very interesting text there. Actually, it says, um, Psalm 96, 13, let all creation rejoice be before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. So. This time Jesus is coming as a judge. So he, is, he, he did come as a savior, but he's going to come as a judge. So he has not finished the judging part. The God has a name. The God we worship has a name. He is also a judge. He is the big judge. And by the way, he is known by another uh, uh, terminology. Because when we say when he came as a baby in manger, people could not accept him as a king of uh, as a king but look at revelations 19 16 turn with me sorry for making you turn the bible so many times but that's how we can understand second coming revelations 19 16 gives another terminology why he should come because he is going to be the king of kings uh, i'm going to read this coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword 1915 sharp sword with which to strike down the nation he will rule them with the iron scepter he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But the first time he came, he was not, he was not ordained as a king of kings of the world. But then when he, whenever he was, whenever, you know, he was ordained as a king, Jesus did not give that. There were many times the Jews came and said, okay, you, be, you become the king. But then he, he shoved away and he just refused that status. And then because he know he's going to come back again, where he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So the fundamental reason why he has to come, because he is a God, he is the judge and he is going to be a judge. So never, so don't ever think like, we can't keep on thinking like, okay, he's a baby Jesus. So only he will celebrate Christmas and then we'll keep him at the Christmas level. No, he's beyond Christmas level. <laughs> That's the first coming. We need to, every time you celebrate Christmas, you have to tell your people, hey, I'm, ta I'm reminding you of the first Christmas, but I'm, rem I'm taking you to the second coming, which is the King of King coming. So I, that is the essence of Christmas, I want to tell you. Every Christmas is an opportunity for the second coming of Jesus, where we talk about uh, God. Now, the second reason why he's coming, it is also... Turn with me. It is a promise. John 14, 3. And I like this John 14, 3 because uh, in this world we live in pain and sorrow and suffering, right? No doubt on that. John 14, 3. Look at that. And if I, this is Jesus himself comforting his disciple. It, uh, in the theme starts that do not let your hearts be troubled. 
you believe in god believe in also in me my father has many rooms houses many rooms if that were were not so would i have told you that i'm going there i'm going there right now he's preparing a place for you for you and me and for you and me and if i go and and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come back he's saying i will come back i will come back and take you to be with me that you also be where i am this is a promise this is a promise so he said i will come back and take you to be with me and and by the way that is a promise given to only his disciples not to everybody in the whole world you have to understand that that means that promise applies to anyone who should become a disciple only whoever believes in the lord so you have to understand i will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where i am okay i'm just going to stop there so these are the two big reasons two big reason it is for sure the lord came as a savior now he is coming as a judge and he is certain his his part is not finished the role of the trinity is still not finished until jesus comes back as a king of kings second there is a big promise we worship a god of promise who fulfills the promise of why he wants us to why is he coming back now let me get into the next question why is he coming and by the way who knows he is coming who knows when he is coming who knows when he is coming turn with me matthew chapter 24 we are going to circle into that matthew chapter 24 a bit so that is very interesting 36 but about the day or hour no one knows not even the angels in heaven nor the son but only the father so if anybody any preacher comes and tells you any uh, anointed or any exclusive uh, fancy people come and say we know the end times uh, there is a black spell or magic some people coming and saying we know what's your last days we know what is going to happen at the end of the world all that is crappy because the bible clearly says no one knows not even angels know it's only i like the word only i put a big orange there only the father knows only the father knows to understand this further i want you to uh, take this example you know jesus is a very simple person the way he talks complex things is through parables through analogies jesus never preaches complex sermons so if you go to today's university many time they teach very complex things you can't even understand what these guys are trying to speak but jesus style is very simple storytelling of parable now even its second coming he uses two imagery but i'm going to take only one imagery now and make it very simple for you to understand one i don't know whether you were hit by a burglar or a thief recently but uh, i in our uh, group there has been a family who's got impacted by a thief coming into their house in london now i just want to tell you that jesus takes an imagery of a thief what chris what are you saying yes then he talks about a thief coming his imagery is coming to a thief four key texts he talks about a thief now all of us are familiar with thief no one in this room cannot be saying you yeah. maybe you have been robbed by some we don't rob anyone but we can get robbed by someone okay so it's okay to be robbed by someone so but the thing is you we don't rob anybody so the thing is he's talking about a thief imagery and i'm going to give you an example of a thief to understand um the question of who if if we know the element who knows only i said the father knows that means we need to know how this thief uh, how the thief acts or the how the thief to understand the behavior of a thief and the context of the thief image now let's read 2442 2442 and uh, two women will be grinding with a hand mill one will be taken the other left therefore keep watch because you do not know what day your lord will come what day your lord will come but understand this if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into so the thief can come in the morning or in the evening but thief now thieves are not stupid the thief usually he plans when you're not uh, kind of you know being around uh, when you're a little easy okay 3 am in the morning that's when i can steal a, that, that happens in canada 
3 a.m. in the morning, that's when they can loot a car, right? They are, or very busy time. These are the busy times where you don't even have time. People just can pay, do. The th today, the thieves are very schematic. So that you have to understand, you don't know when you are, when the times when you are highly prepared or the times when you are lowly prepared. The times you are highly prepared, the times you are lowly prepared. So Matthew 24, 42, he comes like any time. It could be any time. Now, the, the, that is a context he's talking about 42, where he had not known that was coming. He could have kept it watch and would have left his house be broken. So it could be any time, any place. So you also be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. The second, second reference to a thief, I just want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians. Now, this is a book from the gospel. I told you Ma Matthew, who wrote, to, who's a Jewish author, you know, who wrote for the Jewish audience. It's like he is a, he's, he brings a weightage from the segment, how important the second coming to, to the Jews who believes that, you know, they didn't even believe the first coming of Jesus. And he's telling them, you know, be ready about the second coming of Jesus because he's going to be the king of kings. 1 Thessalonians 5 2. Somebody wants to read that? For you know very little that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Like a thief in the night. Okay. And, and that is very clear. This is Apostle uh, Paul. I want you to say that it is not just in Matthew 24. It is Jesus talking about the quotation is like a, where about Jesus, right? Now, Apostle Paul is hinting and referring to the same imagery. That means it is very, very important. It can be any time. Where Apostle Paul himself saying that shows any time in the Bible, any theme coming again and again by two, three writers, it is of significance. Turn with me to 2 Peter 3.10. We thought only Apostle Paul writes about it. What does 2 Peter 3.10 says? What does 2 Peter 3.10 says? 2 Peter 3.10 is very interesting as well. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a road. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. So this is Peter, Apostle Peter, the Peter who was with the, who walked with Jesus in the waters talking about the same thing. Fourthly, it is John. Now look at that. Somebody, two, two disciples who were with Jesus writing it and the Apostle um, Paul, who was not with Jesus, but then yet he emphasizes that. And John, who is the most loving disciple, Revelations 3 3. If somebody wants to read Revelations 3 3. Yeah, Revelations 3 3 talks about the same message where it says, Remember therefore what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Primarily, primarily the thief, I want you to keep in mind the imagery is when, when, whenever, when Jesus used the message of or used the analogy of a thief, he is just talking about the timing. It means at an hour, in a day, all those four texts which I asked you to go through, it all infers to the timing, the time. So it could be any time. Now, you could see Jesus coming in your time or not in your time, or it could be before we speak today, he can come, or through this, uh, uh, through this session right now when we are speaking, Jesus can come now, right? And he can come even after 15 years. You never know what he can, for him, a death. what is that? A turn with me, turn with me to this particular verse on 1 Thessalonians, which says, uh, uh, it, it talks about how for a day, the Lord, it's thousand, day, thousand days, you know, a, th a day is like a thousand years, right? So it can, it can be the, uh, you know, it can be here and now, or it can be even later. So this is more important to understand. Uh, that is Second Peter 3, 8. Uh, that will give you more. I'm going to read that for you. Second Peter 3, 8. But do not forget this one, th one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. So perhaps your children come and say, you told me, you told me yesterday he's going to come, but uh, where is he? 
a day is like a thousand years. You never know what God's plan is because only the Father knows. So I told you uh, why, why is he coming? Now I told you who knows when he is coming and to understand that better, it is important to understand the imagery of a thief. So the thief can come anytime. So means, I don't know what's your last uh, habit through the night because he can come anytime. It can be when you're pre unprepared as unprepared as well. Or, uh, or your first waking thought is, you never know what's your first waking thought. Like uh, how prepared are you and how not prepared are you? So the most important thing we need to understand is like the element of timing. Now we get into the most important thing, which is uh, I told you why, I told you who. Now I'm going to give you a little bit on what are the end signs. What? What are the end signs? Now, uh, the Matthew chapter 24 covers the entire glimpse on what are the end signs. There's no miss on that. But uh, to understand Matthew very, very real, I want you to turn to this particular analogy where, where in Matthew chapter 24 he talks about verse 36. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father, as it was in the days of Noah. Okay, as it is in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, we're going to go into a little bit of detail into Noah to understand the end time signs. Now, you all know the end time signs of Noah. I'm just going to go into chapter Genesis chapter 3. Turn with me. Jesus compares his coming to the end times of Noah. I don't have time to cover everything, but I just want to tell you um, what exactly what God is trying to say here. Chapter six starts with the title says wickedness in the world. Okay. Now it goes on to say, verse five, where chapter six of Genesis, verse five, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled and his heart was deeply troubled. Now you can go through all that. He and the Lord wiped out, right? Um, I will wipe out, wipe from the face of the earth, the human race whom I have created and with them the animals, the birds and the creatures and everything I move along the, uh, along the ground. Now, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, now, now keep your finger, little index finger there and keep yours, Matthew chapter 24. Who is talking about it? Jesus talking about it. Jesus travels way up to some, some zillion years you can take there where he's going back to Noah and he's bringing that how Noah was like the man. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, this is a very powerful truth. Now, God gives a command. What? God gives a command. I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail, but I'm just going to give you an overarching thing. How many people got into the ark? Eight people, right? People. Eight, eight. people. Yeah, eight. only eight people. Was that the ark was made only for eight people? No, the size mm -hmm. of the ark, I, uh, I want you to look at that. The size of the ark is like, I'm, so, I'm going to read this for you. This is how you are. I told you, go back to Genesis chapter 6. West. 15. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Okay, make a roof for it, leaving behind the roof an opening one cubit high, and uh, put a door on the side and one window. So it's nothing but it's just like saying uh, it's going to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Or, uh, uh, you know, it's he gives you the description, and the, there's going to be one window and one door. And that kind of thing. So it's a very clear uh, architecture design. Everything is stated out very clearly. So God is telling that you do that. And it's not just for Noah. And not just for the eight people. But for 
whole lot of people to come in and God aspired for a whole lot of people. Now, but you know, only a minority got in. Let me say that. Only a minority got in. This is maybe to help Gita here. God wants everybody to come in, but only a minority got in. Who got in? Only who, who believed that God is serious and he's saying, I want to come back and believe in my son. For God so loved the world that he gave his own and only son. But whoever believes in him will have eternal life, right? So whoever believes in him, will whoever believes in the Lord and is the one who are ready, right? So one, I mean, look at, to understand the second coming, I want you to go into the analogy of, because the, Jesus himself says, go how Noah was preparing, okay? Now this person, Noah, till the last time, till he could board the ark, you know, what is his job? He was only preaching. He had, he, come on, he's a well-to-do person. You, you should not think Noah, what you see in the picture, like very sad, Noah haggard and all that. Noah had a lot of people put on the job and he was trying to get that ark done. Between that time where the design given, architecture design, flowchart given and the deployment of the ark, how many years? 120 years. 120 years. It's not just God gave yesterday and tomorrow morning the ark was up and sailing and then the rains came. No. God waited. God waited. And Noah was big. Noah was not just... Uh, Everyone thinks like, okay, Noah was only doing, uh, you know, very seriously making the ark alone. That's not his problem. He, you, he, the Bible says he was also preaching the gospel to many so that everybody could get into that. Now, what I, what I want to tell you, number one, it's a minority who got in. So what tells us now is there will be a minority going in. Don't expect the whole city to come into that. I wish the whole city comes in. But there is a high chance, narrow is the road to heaven. So you may not find many. That is the truth. So second, you find that uh, there is a the time difference between when it was given and when it is taken. It speaks about the Lord's patience. In fact, Peter says like, you know, and even Paul talks about it. It's not that the Lord doesn't want to come. He doesn't, it's not that he, he doesn't want to judge you quickly, but he's patient so that many could come to the faith, right? That is more and more important. Now, what people were doing, whenever Noah was telling them, turn with me to Hebrews 11. He's, he's part of the faith book, right? Faith chapter. Here, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about that. I'm going to turn that to Hebrews chapter 11. And you can read that in uh, verse um, 7. Okay. And this is very interesting. Why faith Noah when warned about things not yet seen? Now this not yet seen means he has not seen the rain yet. He has not seen the flood yet. There has not been a rain until then. He has not seen yet. In holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is keeping with faith. Now, I can, we can speak on Noah as a character and you can see that Noah was diligent to obey and he obeyed. But then his job was not just uh, getting it done, but you see that, that many people were not believing in his story, believing in him. In fact, there were many people were laughing, sneering, making jokes. And he said, what, Noah, what are you saying? You going, yeah, are you serious? There's going to be rain? No, we don't believe it. Are you serious? Jesus is coming. Sometimes when you give a tract, sometimes when you share share about the Lord, they think you're crazy. They think you're, people think around you crazy, but that doesn't stop the fact and the truth and that 143 promise, prophecies that is yet to come. That does not change the truth. People laughing, uh, laughing, sneering, uh, making joke, all that doesn't change the truth. The truth remains as it is. So... Number one, as I told you, I, I told you about this context of um, what are the end signs. The end signs you see is the, the typical things what you have seen in the times of Nova. That is what we will see even now. Okay, so that is what we're seeing. Tell me uh, if, you're, if you're not seeing those signs. You, are, you will be a minority. It will not be a, of course, that is not that we should not miss the others, but uh, it is a minority we see that. And uh, 
but the boat or the ship, the ark is for many and many to come in. Now, the second thing I just want to tell you, what are the other signs you would see? I told you about the sign. Just give me a minute. I'm going to take this for you. This is more popular these days. What is the more popular things you hear these days? People come and say like, uh, you know, there's so many doctrines you hear, right? There's so many doctrines you hear. Sometimes you get confused what people are saying. And even this concept of tribulation, I just want to help you here. Uh, concept of tribulation. Uh, let me tell you, let, let's go. What is false doctrine? Second Timothy 3.13. Somebody wants to read Second Timothy 3.13. Second Timothy three thirteen. While evil yeah. men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Yeah, this is Paul's advice to Timothy. Okay, Paul's advice to Timothy. You can not only be deceived, you can you cannot look at that. He's saying deceiving and being deceived. So there is a high chance all of us in this room can get deceived. That's what I would say. It's nobody can, no one. No one, none of us, I, even myself, I'm saying, no one can say, oh, I'm tall, therefore I cannot fall. No, we can, the potential to be deceived is so much. That's what Paul writes to Timothy. Be ready that there's going to be many imposters, not many, few. Now today in this last age where we hear many, many people coming in the name of me, that is many Jesus you hear, right? Many people, people uh, talking about even among the churches, Today, there's more confusion within the church because there are so many people teaching so many things and we don't know whether they, what is teaching is right. Like, uh, as we are saying, like, you know, is this much sin, it's okay. You know, there's nothing called black and white. Even the, even the gradient of sin levels, these are, all, these are all not from the Bible, okay? Second thing they say, uh, you know, uh, even the tribulation, you know, all these things will come later for us it is not like that we are not you know we are saved by the grace of jesus so we can continue as we are <laughs> all these are not from the law not from the bible so that is why paul writes to timothy as an advice beware beware be watchful that's what he's saying okay the second thing you will see many false doctrines has happened and i think even peter efforts not just paul second peter three three I can read that for you. Second Peter 3.3. 3. If you got it, it's fine. Above all, you must understand in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on it as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget. So he's talking about scoffers, people who can, who can really tweak the doctrine. So you need to understand false doctrine is not massively changing the entire content. They will only change little. They will only change little, like the prepositions they change. That's how the devil seeds. Uh, you need, you'll get confused. Did, did it, for example, Jesus, Jesus is coming, but not immediately or something like that they will change so like a small small corrections they can make minor edits which is not from the word so you need to be very watchful what kind of doctrine you're teaching for understanding a false doctrine you should know the right doctrine to know the right doctrine you should study the word and that's the whole intention of this uh, <laughs> this prayer group right if i know what is bad you to know the bad orange, you need to know what is the good orange looks like. But if I don't know what is a good orange, how will you know the bad orange? So please spend time to understand the good, good orange. 
So the problem with today in the church is people want to know all the false doctrine without knowing what's the true doctrine. So that's why the Bible says, you know, search the scriptures like the Brian believers. So there is going to be false doctrine. We cannot say there will not be false doctrine. Plenty are going to come. Everything you, I am seeing it. I work for a Christian organization. I, I see that what kind of things we need to understand because you're so confused. What is the Bible speaking on it? So you need to understand having a clarity on what is God's doctrine on each thing. So please spend time on that. And the second thing you will see, as I told you, it's going to be in the times of Noah, only minority and uh, the Lord's patience does means it's not, he's not coming again. 120 years he took, but then to build the ark, but it's a waiting time for God, people to get inside the ark, but uh, it doesn't change the truth. And the second thing you will see more and more people have become self love or kind of, I would say like uh, narcissistic. Matthew 24, 11, 24, 12 talks about it. Matthew 24, 12. I'm going to read that for you. If you're there, you can read that. Matthew 24, 12. It says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Love of most will grow cold. I don't know. Have you seen that? Uh, the entire concept of love has declined. Uh, people give a lot of uh, interpretation like knowledge, intelligence and all that. At the end of the day, they don't care. People don't care. Even within families, many families, between partners, between children, children don't care of parents, parents don't care of children. Yeah, you've seen that. Wives don't care of husbands, husbands don't care of wives. And there are even church pastors don't care of congregation, congregation doesn't care of pastors. You find that it's not, let's not even judge the world. I'm just saying, let's take our immediate community, immediate, immediate level. Have you seen that kind of closeness which you had several years back? Day by day, that the love is the love, the concept of love, the agape love is becoming cold, 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 coldest it will become. By then, you won't find really love. And then you can really say who is like, who is that one or two? Who is that three or four who can stand with you through, you can say that defined as genuine love? And the last one, this is a, I'm only giving you three signs, which, and the primary comparison, you should keep it as no worse time so that you understand this. The most important thing is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's the last days. Only with the Holy Spirit, you can know the Lord. Because unless the, unless the Spirit brings you to the Lord, you will never know the Lord. Who says that? Turn with me to Joel. Somebody wants to read Joel. Joel uh, chapter 2. 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2, 28 and 29. I'm going to read this for you. It says, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Where? In the last days I will spirit I will pour out my spirit on all people in the last days. So you're in the last days, there's heavy outpouring of the spirit. When the Holy Spirit was taken, that is when the church is taken. Please understand that. So when the Holy Spirit is taken, the earth will become like hell, hell on earth. So you have to understand, we are in a grace period or a mercy period where the Holy Spirit is bringing people. I hear, see Punjabis coming. Yesterday also I saw a few Punjabis coming and saying, you know, we know Jesus. Uh, you know, we do it. And, uh, you know, we, we keep, the Guru Granth is there, but I still, I keep Jesus. I believe in the Lord. And there are many people who say that. And across even professional life, people come and say, you know, I have my quiet time. I do, uh, I have, I believe in Jesus. Seriously, are you? So, so many people are coming to them coming to the Lord because of the last days. And Acts 2.17, Acts 2.17 still talks about the moving of the Holy Spirit, which it says 2.17, which very clear, in the last days, so it is last days, my friend, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. So it is very clear, last days is not only a time, you people think, oh my God, last days means uh, people, you'll see false doctrine, a lot of bad things happen. <laughs> uh, 
last days uh, people will not love each other there will be war there will be nation against nation pandemic i want to tell you last days it's outpouring of spirit people will be filled with the holy spirit just on the street you never know tongues of fire can be on anybody right and god is accelerating the way people want to come into the truth because he wants not just eight people inside the ark he want many people to come and it's not our efforts alone will help the holy spirit makes it happen now i told you about why i told you about who and i told you about what are the end signs now i'm going to tell you about how okay now we know this is truth we know this is important uh, there is a, a no no way we can say oh no it's not going to happen this is this is going to happen now how are we ready in fact uh, jesus talks about the word ready at least uh, a dozen times in that 24 verse the i mean chapter 24 of matthew he says be ready be ready be ready now what is be ready in fact what we read about the 10 virgins is all about ready now talking about the readiness we are talking about readiness i i just want to talk about two areas where we need to be always be ready one point of time uh and you say be ready uh um, Jesus before he goes up to the cross he gets up and picks up the towel and he wants to wash his disciples feet right and at that time he when he comes to peter and peter says you know give me a bath i'm not uh, i'm so dirty make me clean and jesus says you you don't need a bath because you're already done you just need our clean up you know just need to clean your feet so the thing is most of the time we have, we don't the process of having a bath or that kind of you we have finished it like you know you have you have already given your heart to the lord you believe in the lord and uh, you believe and you you have repented and you believe that he's going to come but what god wants us to be is like daily cleansing daily daily pedicure or daily manicure about your soul which needs cleaning so the number one be ready i want to put it in two words when god says be ready he's talking about being holy it's a simple word simple and straight it's very simple and straight he just says be holy when unless you're holy you you're not going to uh, you're going to miss the bus that's, that's the most important thing of course you uh, we can we can say whatever eligibility but the most important thing is how do we be holy only the eligible gets in 1 john 3 1 to 3 somebody wants to read 1 john 3 1 to 3 John talks about it very clearly neatly and clearly I'm going to read that one John chapter 3 verse 1 to 3 see what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and this is what we are the reason the world does not know us is that it not know him we are friends now we are children of God and what we will be not yet be made known but we know that when Christ appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is now all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure now simple thing when you say purify yourself it's just keeping up your conscience clean and keeping your accounts clean so my way of saying purity is god has given us a beautiful two 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 alarms within us one is a holy spirit right holy spirit once you're filled with the holy spirit once you receive the gift of the holy spirit he sensitizes you like a little alert within you you know you've gone little stain inside you he tells you, you know you oh that word you shouldn't have spoken or maybe that person you should go and say sorry or you shouldn't have uh, you know behave like that your integrity you know, all that the holy spirit alerts but even uh, there is something called conscience if someone who is not saved they have something they are governed by conscience so we cannot say oh some that those people don't know but they know do you think all the people who did the mass murder they just did it just like that no they have a conscience god says they have a conscience that is like a gatekeeper even psychologist says that's in the id, the ego or the inside right the the super ego within the self has it's like a governing body so it alerts like when it is holy when it is unholy where there is a stain where there is not a stain on a shirt where is the which pocket needs cleaning is it on your words is it on your thought is it on your behavior is it on the conduct but god talks about about that kind of holiness second 
every day this is like a daily check that's why jesus gets up and says to peter you need a cleansing you you don't need a bath you just need a cleansing so i i think as a as a team as a family of believers together we need to constantly think am i clean am i clean i mean uh, that is more important because he can come any time he can come right now he can come tomorrow he can come a uh, thousand years from now but how are you doing the problem today is like sometimes we lose the alertness so i would say let us keep a process of closing your bills every day um, you're closing your bills every day you have a check in at the before you go to bed you just think like what are things uh, sometimes it may need to be a rushing and saying to sorry to somebody before you sleep it could be that because you never know if it comes to the night you're not clear right so um, it could be that kind of sensitivity and priority is important so be holy because that's eligibility and that's what you're saying and when you're being ready um, accountability when you go before the throne of grace it is individual accounting there is no collective accounting they god doesn't going to call okay peter's family come mother in law come in you father in law come in all of you one account book it is not like that it is individual account individual account because it says you will approach the throne of grace to find grace and mercy it is an individual account so you and uh, i want to say that very clearly when you are being ready you are being one as holiness being holy but then why you're doing it it's individual account and it is based on your past performance i want to tell you when you go to the uh, go and give your accounts it's what you have god has given you a lot of opportunities right here on earth right on what you have done how have you used it some of us get 60 years some of us get 10 years some of them have lost life some of them get very less life but the thing is god wants to say how you have performed what you have done and what you have not done given the opportunity where you are for example you are in africa and god has given you an opportunity your god that is how you how you have performed against it so it is very clear god is going to go through that book of book and see the records how it has been how you maximize come on this is a saturday morning we are all doing together why why are we doing all this together it's not about living on earth it's living about with the lord eternal life right second thing i'm not there are so many things to do but i'm just saying how to be ready because you have to give individual accounts and second it is all about your past you cannot go back and correct like what i mean to say is i can correct right now but once i die my account is going to be like how i live with the lord right because it's i'm old i i'm already done with my mortal body life this is something giving accounts to your mortal body life until you have a body a flesh and blood you're only giving accounts on what god has given you a chance to do the second most thing being holy second is be hurry to witness what hurry to witness turn with me luke uh, matthew 24 14 matthew 24 14 i'm just going to read that for you Matthew 24:14 that's a, that's one more time where god is uh, bringing that essence of uh, Matthew 24:14 i'm going to read that for you um and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come and then the end will come now preaching or sharing testimony quick to witness uh quick to evangelize Uh, they did a recent survey uh, at least in north america they did the survey they found 65% 65% went and said evangelism is not their priority today that's a new con- concept they're saying what is evangelism is evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread right that's it now <laughs> they think that is not a priority but the bible all the gospels finishes with an evangelism call go into all the world and preach the good news and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the father and the son right all this is what discipleship now the thing is today the church has come to the uh, to the element where they say it's okay if you're not sharing about jesus you come to church you're okay all is okay no it's not be ready but making others ready let me say that it's not be ready all of us are good in be ready 
but are you making others ready? That is what be willing to witness. Luke 19 and 13 also, talk, I mean, before Luke, I can read this verse 46 of uh, chapter 24 for you. 46 says this, and he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. So the thing is, if you see that word, 10 virgins or all the analogies, everywhere it talks about making others ready. Now, my question to you, my friend, how are you making ready your own children? Right? That's the immediate thing. How are you making? It's nothing, I would say nothing wrong in telling them the truth is Jesus is going to come. Whoever is ready, whoever has that will be getting in. They'll get really nervous, but tell the truth as it is. And uh, what Daffy was saying is right. right? Tell the truth as it is. And you have to tell them it's an individual account. There, I cannot say, oh my, I can't do recommendation letter for you. I can't do anything, but I have to tell the truth to you. It's okay. I have to tell the truth. Have you told Jesus at your workplace? Have you told Jesus in your family? Uh, are you shy about talking about Jesus? There are many times people don't even say that. People think like today you cannot even share about Jesus to anybody. But the Bible emphasis on evangelism, getting people ready. The 10 virgins, please tell them to get ready. The most important thing is like, how are we making others ready? Now being ready and making others ready, it's a 24 hour job. 24 bar 7 job. If you are saying, okay, I have to be ready. I am, am I holy? Am I good? My family is ready. All that is fine. That is only 50%. One side of the coin. What is the other side of the coin? Take the coin. If you're ready, wonderful. How many people have you made them or making them ready? That is the second part of the coin. Now, man, there are many people who come to Christian faith. They take the one side of the coin. Oh, I'm ready. I'm fine. I'm do good. How many people are you making them ready? Because if, say Shubha, you're getting to, if I'm making you ready, you are making million people ready. You touch your family to make ready because he's going to come anytime. So it's a 24 hour, seven days a week. This is a continuous activity. So that means every time, even if you meet silly people, you're going to meet some people for just in a passing passenger. Nothing wrong in telling them, do you know Jesus came 22,000 years? He's going to come back again. What? I know many times they say, what? No, that's the truth. I just thought I should tell you because in case you didn't happen to not to know it. So you may be looked at. Yes, Noah was laughed. Noah was sneered. Noah was uh, whatever. He was like completely, even before his boarding could take place. That's what the Bible says. Even before boarding to the ark, he was doing it. So my friend, I just want to close with this thought today, the urgency on Luke chapter 21. I'm going to read this. Luke chapter 21, 36. Luke chapter 21, 36. This is a very powerful verse, but then it speaks volume. 36. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. Who's saying? Jesus is saying. Be always that's why I said 24 bus 7. Always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. That you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So you're going to stand before the Son of Man. Now, gospel is telling them, today we tell Jesus loves you, Jesus heals you, Jesus is a miracle worker. All that is not gospel. Let me be very clear. Gospel is saying God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So believe in this son. And Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only truth and life. Jesus is the bread of life. Or Jesus is the Father, only way to eternal life. Therefore, believe in him. Number one, you have to tell them. And then what you're going to say, repent. Get rid of your old self. And John the Baptist was very clear. If you don't repent, you cannot, you know, you're not saved. So you got to tell them, repent. Get rid of your old self. And then you say, receive the... Uh, you know, receive the Holy Spirit. So it's most important when we don't complete this entire three-point circle, you're still not covering the gospel. So if you're just telling them, you know, Jesus is coming, you just started it, but you're making people ready. Making disciples is our 24 bar 7 job. Shall we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for teaching us and opening this deep truth. Many a time we have taken a very complacent approach or a a lethargic uh, priority on this key 
key key activity which you want us to do it's a command it's a promise that you're coming back we are ready but how many people have we made it ready i remember the samaritan woman a lot she just as soon as she sees you she rushes back into the village brings the village back oh father give us that kind of heart the heart and the compassion for people so that we can bring many to righteousness the time is short oh father help us to uh, be there and stand before you when you we come before you that we carry more people alongside us it could be alongside in our family people alongside from our workplace people alongside uh, in the city where you have planted us oh lord if we have sinned and wasted time in any of these forgive us oh father help give us that urgency let your holy spirit quicken our hearts so that we keep this as a top most priority day in and day out and not just be self selfish around who we are and what we want to do uh, help us to get this calling straight and reaching many into righteousness and the purpose so that we get that great commission done in our lives thank you oh god for the speaking to us and we are just going to get this and make it happen as doers of the word in jesus name we ask amen god bless any questions i just want to take questions